Hello, everyone. I'm Anna Rose. I'm the Exhibitions and Programming Associate here at the Venda. Thanks so much for joining us today for Cold War Spaces. Uh, today, I'd like to welcome our guest, Juliana Furst, who will be speaking on the topic of flower power space, the Soviet hippie community. She's a senior research fellow at the Leibniz Center for Contemporary History in Potsdam, and she co-curated our 2018 exhibition, Socialist Flower Power, Soviet Hippie Culture. She's also the author of the forthcoming book, Flowers Through Concrete, Explorations in Soviet Hippie Land. That'll be coming out on Oxford University Press. Today's program is going to be about a 30 minute conversation between Juliana and Yu Sigal, the Venda's chief curator and director of programming. After that, we'll leave about 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, so please get your questions to put in the Q&A box during that time. Um, and it, as always, we appreciate everyone's questions, um, but we ask that you keep them short to one or two sentences just so that we can try to get to them all. Um, we also have the chat function open. Um, so if you wanna, uh, if you have any comments or things that aren't questions, feel free to drop that in the chat box. Um, and just a reminder to change the, um, there's the blue button that says all panelists and attendees. Um, just make sure that that is set to all panelists and attendees, not just all panelists, so everyone else can see it. And as we're getting started, feel free to say hi. Um, and it's always nice to see what city people um, are tuning in from. We'll be posting the recording of today's um, program on our Vimeo page, so if you want to share it with anyone else afterwards or go back on our previous programs, you can find that on our Vimeo page. Um, I'd also like to add um, a very special related programming for this week. Um, as part of our virtual Friday night film series, uh, this week's selection is the Estonian documentary, Soviet Hippies. So very related to this topic, Juliana was actually associate producer um, and research advisor for that film. Um, the director kindly made it available for our audience to stream on Vimeo for free for the following week starting today. So afterwards, I'll um, put that link and the password in the chat and also send it in a follow-up email. And lastly, I'd like to thank Susan Horowitz and Rick Feldman for generously supporting discussion series at the Venda and our virtual programs. And now you will get us started. Thank you very much, Anna Rose. Uh, remarkable as it was to hear about German hip hop in last week's uh, Cold War Spaces interview with Leonard Schmieding, it may sound as surprising to learn about a widespread hippie movement in the Soviet Union. I didn't know anything about it until I first met Juliana Furst, who brought a unique collection of Soviet hippie ephemera to the Wyndham Museum and curated the exhibition Socialist Flower Power, as mentioned by Anne Rose, two years ago. Indeed, hippiedom was not restricted to the United States, Western Europe, and the affluent countries in East Asia. But what did it mean to be a hippie in the Soviet Union? What were the risks and gains? How did how did they look and what was their philosophy? And what is their lasting heritage? We will discuss all these questions and more in the next half hour. Juliana, welcome to Cold War Spaces. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, hello from Berlin. And thank you for all the hellos already from all around the world. It's uh, truly an exhilarating experience to sitting in one's own living room and um, having all of that. <laughs> right. So let's uh, start with a very general question. How did the hippie movement start in the Soviet Union? And also, I'm very curious to hear where Soviet hippies uh, got their information from. And maybe you can say a few words about how widespread the movement was. I will actually go to a shared screen because I have a few pictures, okay. most of which actually are in possession of the Vendor Museum itself. Um, because that will give a good idea of um, where all these hippies um, started and, and how they started. So I'm, I'm starting with a sort of kind of pictorial tour. Um, I hope it all works, yep. So really the beginning, of course, uh, was music. And while one could go back all the way into the beginning of the uh, 20s to flappers and foxtrotters and um, the whole jazz legacy, in earnest, it all took off uh, with the Beatles. And here you see a young Beatles fan in Leningrad. Um, as you can see, he did a very good um, uh, time with uh, imitating him, uh, the, the Beatles. Um, in Riga and all across the Soviet Union, the twist was immensely popular. And there was a kind of beatnik movement um, which preceded the hippies, very similar to what happened um, in the US, um, where you have the confluence of um, a rock music, pop music movement coming together together 
with an intellectual movement um, around existentialist literature, um, um, a certain kind of style, dancing, and the belief that um, you are not only separate from your intellect, but that your whole body is expressing uh, what you believe. And that is, you can see that very well here in these pictures um, taken on a rooftop in, in Riga by young beatniks who later on graduated into the hippie movement. Um, style, of course, was an important contributor. Uh, which came across from the from the West, uh, which is why we have the earliest hippies movements in the Soviet Union in the Western regions. Here we have um, in Tallinn, you can see the hair is not quite long enough yet, um, but the trousers um, and the shirts are getting there. This is Alexandre Domedontov, who was um, the big trouser maker in, in Tallinn, the big jeans maker, um, and this is his uh, early beginnings. Um, he later on had much longer hair and much more funky trousers. Um, in Moscow, um, which soon became the epicenter of uh, hippiedom, just because it is the biggest city, it was, even though it is not very much in the West um, or Western located, it had, of course, a lot of connection to the West by via the children of privileged um, families. Um, and here we see members of the um, journalism faculty of the Moscow State University, where really one can say this is where sort of an old organized hippie movement in the Soviet Union originated. This is also kind of pre-hippie, but for example, the girl in the coat um, is the daughter of the Pravda correspondent to New York, um, Strelnikov. Her name is Tanya, Tatiana Strelnikova, and of course, um, via these kind of connections, you could get um, a lot of uh, knowledge. So a few years later, even about a year later than that picture, you have a love street in Kaunas. Um, you have hippies um, going to the beach in Palanga. Um, and uh, you have flower power um, arriving in Moscow, which really then uh, becomes the biggest and most driving community of them all, even though in you know, the whole Western border region, uh, hippies um, remain widespread, but we also have hippies in Magadan and former Gulag towns of Kulima um, and in, in Siberia. Um, and really almost everywhere except for one would, must, would say the, the um, Muslim fringe, um, so much less so in the stands and not so much in the Caucasus. Right, so Juliana, I guess not all the hippies were sons or daughters of Pravda correspondents. So how did they even know about um, the hippie phenomenon? Well, I mean, I, I have to say a surprising number of them um, were children of, of families who had some kind of Western connection. Of course, that could be via privilege. Or it could also be, as it was in the Western regions, especially the Baltic states, um, via family connections. Um, a lot of um, Baltic states had um, people who had left during the war where displaced people had settled in the West, um, especially among uh, Jewish youngsters, you had relatives um, who had emigrated. Um, and it sort of kind of sipped across uh, the Iron Curtain. And the, the, the hippies really are a good phenomenon to, to showcase that you can isolate a country, but even before the arrival of the internet, you could never quite um, fully close it off. Um, and it took very little. It really is a handful of items um, that um, kind of transported uh, the knowledge. And then, of course, the hippies is that uh, interesting phenomena that initially, of course, it was um, seen as a left-wing phenomena, um, which was uh, critical against capitalism, critical of America, critical of the war um, um, of, uh, in Vietnam. And all of that fed, of course, into um, um, Soviet um, ideology it, itself. Um, and the very first reports which the Soviet press brought about um, Soviet American hippies were actually favorable to kind of melancholic about as poor youngsters who have lost their way, but um, they really um, are in essence, um, good, good people. And if only they could get the ideological conviction, meaning Marxism, um, they would uh, be um, surely succeed. So it was seen initially as a decomposition of, of the West. Um, and it was only when uh, Soviet hippies became more prominent um, in the Soviet Union itself that the rhetoric started to turn to be more hostile. Right, so the, uh, it was um, um, a positive phenomenon in uh, the United States, but not so much when it uh, um, developed in the Soviet Union itself. I, I think one of the very aspects of your research is um, that you describe how these hippie communities that were so widespread all over the Soviet Union were in touch with each other. And one of the central concepts there is the word systema. Can you explain a little bit what that meant? 
Well, it's one of the idiosyncrasies of Soviet hippies that on the one hand, they tried to escape uh, the system, uh, but uh, created a system, or maybe it is actually not an idiosyncrasy, but a completely logical conclusion. And um, when I was researching them, I could not help but marvel in how over the years they really became very adept in surviving in the conditions they, they found. Um, and since they found a highly effective systemic repressive apparatus, um, they kind of learned that the way of how they would survive is, of course, in numbers, um, but also in the sort of kind of knowledge that, that they are not alone. Um, so they created a system which now, of course, can be created within instances uh, via Instagram, Facebook, etc., um, of a, a mutual network of, um, of knowing each other. And a lot of people, of course, knew each other personally, but there were certain signs and gestures um, and, of course, outer markers where people could immediately recognize this is one of our people. Um, and in most cities where there were hippie communities, they had um, a place um, where they would meet and where if you came as a foreigner or as a stranger to the city, you knew you could go to this place um, and you would find hippies there and they would provide you with shelter and with food and with entertainment and probably with a little bit of drugs and music. So here on the left, um, in the top right, uh, top left picture, you see the Kazan Cathedral in Leningrad, which was um, one of these places where, people, where hippies were known to hang out. In Moscow, on the right hand side, you see the Novi Abad, um, or then Kalinin Prospect, um, but more popular even was Pushkin Square, which was right in the center of Moscow, right next to the Moscow city government. Um, on the left hand uh, lower corner, you see the famous Gorka, that was a little hill in Tallinn. Uh, where people assembled. And then uh, in addition to this kind of um, secret geography, you also then got a special calendar. Um, on the 1st of May, people need to come to Tallinn to um, start what was called the start of the season. Um, and uh, later on, there were summer camps happening um, in, in the Baltic states. And then there were certain places in the Crimea where uh, people would um, meet. Gosuf was one of these places um, where especially a sort of more alcohol orientated hippie um, community would regularly come down in the summer. Um, so the, the kind of internal connections really um, worked very well and fostered rituals and um, codes um, and by the end, and which is I think why the hippies survived for so long, because long after American hippies had dispersed into all sorts of different movements, um, Soviet hippies were still going strong, um, literally until the early 1990s. It was actually in the end uh, capitalism that killed them off, not socialism. Right. Do you have any sense how many people uh, were uh, considered themselves to be hippies in the Soviet Union? It's very difficult um, because, yeah. of course, it start already starts with what makes a hippie. Um, and the hippies were very keen on differentiating even among themselves. So they were pioneering, which were new hippies, and they had to then graduate to become um, older year, which were the old hippies. Um, and of course, the authorities made a different a distinction. Uh, there you were, became a hippie the moment your hair went below your shoulder. Um, but in the early 70s, I have relatively reliable information that there were about two to 3,000 people in Moscow alone um, who were part of that sistema. Um, nice. And Moscow certainly was numerically the strongest community. Um, but um, my guess is that at any given point between 1970 and 1988, there would be about 10 to 20,000 uh, hippies, um, really committed hippies who have forsaken a Soviet career, have forsaken normal Soviet life, um, floating around the various parts of the Soviet Union. Right. So what did the Soviet authorities do to control and even suppress the movement? Well, it's very interesting because you can really um, see um, the tactics, KGB tactics um, developing. So initially there was a period of um, only the police would care for them, mainly because they considered them a nuisance on the street. So they would be arrested, uh, fingerprinted, um, the, the details taken, supposedly there was um, a very famous police point uh, on Gorky Street um, and they had a file in the 1960s already called He P with one P, um, which the hippies always uh, thought was, was fairly funny. And um, hippie number three was supposedly Yura Borakov, who was the founder of the Sistema in, in uh, Moscow. Um, later on, um, the repressions um, became uh, more severe. Um, but never uh, fully 
coherent. Um, so while if you made a political statement or went to a political demonstration, you, you knew what was going to happen. You were arrested um, and, and sentenced to a certain number um, of years in prison or declared insane. As a hippie, a, a, a huge variety of things um, could um, happen to you. So for a while, they rounded people up and sent them to the army and especially to very far away places like the border to China, which actually at the time was quite a dangerous place because there were several border skirmishes. Um, later on, um, they would literally just put him into psychiatric hospitals, which was made easier by, them, uh, by the hippies themselves in order to escape army service. Hippies would pretend um, to be mad uh, or insane um, in order to get a diagnosis of schizophrenia. That would mean about three months in a psychiatric hospital, but then release uh, from um, military service forever. However, it also meant a stamp in their internal passports and they were liable to be taken off the street at any moment in time. Um, right. And then in the very end, I think that's the most interesting is when the KGB tried to sort of um, control the hippies and rock loving youth in their own environments. This is when we see the creation of the Leningrad Rock Club um, in 1980 um, and the Moscow Rock Lab Laboratory. Um, which were all con KGB controlled, um, but were actually very famous meeting points for hippies and their wider community. Um, and instead of uh, fully repressing them, they called it curating. So they were curating the subcultures um, of the Soviet Union. The problem was always that subcultures were always a little bit a step ahead of the, uh, of the curators. Um, even though some of them became very famous in their own right. And in fact, one of them uh, went on and created uh, the um, Liberal Democratic Party by Zhirinovsky, um, which was, is nothing uh, liberal and, and democratic. But so you see, no, there were spin doctors already before their time. Very interesting. So in many respects, it seems that the Soviet hippies uh, copied or took inspiration from the hippie movement in the West, for instance, their clothing, long hair, the music, rock music, maybe also free sex, drugs, uh, is what you mentioned. In what respects would you say that they significantly differed from Western hippies? In many ways, on the first glance, um, there's a lot of similarity. I think the one which is the most obvious one, which never quite took off to the same extent, is um, free free love, um, which was a highly disputed um, discourse. And it, it, it depends who one is asking. Some people are convinced they have free love and other people are very convinced there was nothing like free love. Um, but um, once one goes over the, via the first sort of layer of hippodem, uh, one very quickly comes into more Soviet layers. Um, and what I found interesting when I was writing my book uh, was that actually the more I looked, the more I could see how what a good fit the Soviet Union and, and hippiedom actually uh, were. And, and, and it, it served as another explanation of why this movement could exist so long. So while on the first glance, there's a sort of antagonism, people were repressed and put into psychiatric hospitals and were told they couldn't have their hair long. In fact, a lot of conditions in the Soviet Union fostered um, hippiedom. So, of course, it was a society which wasn't terribly materialistic. Um, I mean, it was materialistic in, in so far as a lot of people aspired to a lot of material, but de facto, there wasn't much going around. So there weren't huge wealth differentials. And even if you didn't earn very much, you could live quite okay. Um, so hippies, for example, very often earned their money as models or um, as boiler room attendants um, or as uh, storage workers. and. But even collecting 10 bottles um, of, um, and bringing them back to the shop could feed you for a day or two. So the mm -hmm. threshold of actually having to engage and work to survive was very low, which, which meant that a lot of people could live um, a hippie life for, for quite a long um, time. Uh, so that was, that was uh, one big um, difference. Um, the other one is that, of course, the scarcity of material um, made the whole anti-materialist culture of the hippies um, turning it into a different kind of direction. Um, and uh, it, the, the Soviet Union was, was um, full of things nobody wanted. I mean, uh, that was, of course, the, the irony of, of the economy, that uh, uh, things were produced which nobody wanted, and the things people wanted weren't produced. And the hippies really came into that sort of uh, chasm, and um, they took all um, the, the stuff which didn't sell very well in uh, department stores, like certain textiles. And then they tra tailored their trousers uh, from it or their patchwork. Um, 
And because as a hippie, it was sort of cool to, to not look uh, well made up or um, expensive. Actually, uh, the Soviet Union offered plenty of material to do that. So there were a lot of creative people, a lot of tailors. Um, but of course, also the, the constant um, pressure that was put on them, nonetheless, um, especially ideologically, kept them in a place. So while the, the West fragmented into environmental movements or rather nasty directions like Charles Manson or um, left-wing terrorism um, in, in the Soviet Union, that sort of early hippie spirit, relatively apolitical, actually remained frozen um, in place because, of course, the, the state itself wasn't moving either. So it, 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 the sort of two blocks which defined each other um, kind of remained um, solid. So did uh, hippies identify themselves as being apolitical or were they very critical of, of the regime? How did that work? Were they considered to be enemies of the people by the authorities? Well, certainly after a while they were, and, 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 and um, I'm just coming to a picture here which I wanted to show um, asking about the American or the Western connection, but of course it is exactly that connection which made them so political. There was nothing in the Soviet Union that was apolitical, is of course um, uh, the truth. And, and being um, in, in, enthralled by something which was so clearly American as hippies and um, identifying it as American, as you can see in this letter written by Sonsa Yura Borakov, um, uh, who was the leader of the Sistema in, in, in Moscow. Um, the, the, the tension which was um, there about, uh, insofar as, of course, they knew that American hippies were against the Vietnam War and were critical of American society, but at the same time themselves worshipping um, a lot of things American, that tension was never resolved, but it didn't bother them too much. Um, so they could um, engage in uh, pro-Vietnam or anti-Vietnam War rhetoric um, while at the same time drawing pictures of American flags. That wasn't a contradiction um, for them, but that of course made them highly political in the eyes um, of the um, authorities. Um, and um, of course, uh, what uh, when they crossed lines, which um, were drawn not always officially but unofficially by the Soviet system, um, they could get into real trouble. So Sonsa Yura Borokov tried to organize an anti-Vietnam uh, demonstration in Moscow on the 1st of June, 1971. Um, Which one you might uh, expect uh, would be uh, um, actually seen as something positive by the Soviet authorities. That's absolutely correct. And that is the assumption on which Yura Borokov worked himself. And he in fact uh, did go to the Mossoviet, to the Moscow city government and got permission. And um, was surprised, it was first denied the permission um, and then it was granted. And of course the demonstration ended very tragically with everybody being arrested still in the courtyard um, of the um, uh, Moscow State University. And this is where this picture is actually already a commemorative picture when um, seven years later hippies assembled in that courtyard in commemoration of, of um, the mass arrests there. And um, about, again, numbers are hard to come by. And what I found a really interesting phenomena is that I found absolutely no evidence of this demonstration in the archives, um, which is unusual because usually one finds some sort of evidence and I think it must have been organized from very high profile in, um, as a means of, of basically registering everybody who feels uh, connected to the hippie uh, movement. Um, and um, I, I think it's where about 600 people were arrested, um, among them a very large number um, of people from very privileged families, which I think is another reason of why uh, that whole demonstration was so hush-hush but it also meant the turning point in relations between the state um, and hippies. That is when the state signaled, um, you are considered as, as enemies. Um, and that of course was cemented a year later when in Kaunas um, in May, 1972, Romas Kalanta burned himself um, with um, a cry, freedom to Lithuania, freedom to hippies. Um, and he burned himself at the local meeting point of the hippies, which also happened to be right opposite the party headquarters, um, and that led to huge demonstrations um, on the day of his funeral and riots and counters, which actually only the military put down a few days later. And from that moment on, of course, it was clear that um, hippies were um, considered subversive and to be observed with the utmost care. But because the phenomenon itself was so elusive and it didn't uh, necessarily break any Soviet laws as such, um, 
-hmm. It was always um, a sort of um, waves between repression or actual relative uh, laissez-faire. And as I say, in the 80s, the Soviet state decided to, to curate it rather than repress it. Right. So looking at uh, your uh, photos, it seems like a nice mixture of boys and girls. Can you say something about the role of young women in the hippie movement? Um, yes, um, I just have a very nice picture of um, a woman named Yoko, which I want to get to. That these, these were on the drugs, but we can, I can come in the Q&A, right. um, can go back to them. Um, so it was indeed um, a, a, a movement of men as well as, as, as women. Um, and um, in fact, um, some of the founding members and very, very important ideological figures uh, were women. And there was Sveta Markova. Um, in Moscow in the late 60s and her friend Ophelia Barabash, known as, um, well, Svetlana Barabash, known as Ophelia. Um, and um, they were for Moscow, which was so much the center of the, the future all union happy movement, very much um, the ideological um, prepara, somebody like Sonse, who um, is commonly seen as the founder of the Sistema. He was very much the practical guy. He, he did organizational questions, uh, while the ideological backbone was um, given by, by women. Um, women, of course, were um, sort of, um, f were had to face a Soviet reality sometimes sooner rather than later than, the, than men, uh, mainly um, because um, when they had children, they had to face the choice of um, either to a certain extent reintegrating back into the Soviet mainstream for the sake um, of actually um, having their children, keeping their children, um, sending their children to, to school and, and kindergarten. Um, or the, the true um, happy life. And, and different people made different um, choices. But um, it is interesting how prominent women were in, in the origins of the hippie movement and how for a long time uh, women were remembered much less. I have to say it changes slightly again because um, women in Russia or in this general ex-Soviet bloc live a lot longer than men. And the truth is now they're just literally many more ex-hippie um, women left than there are ex-hippie men. Um, so the commemoration is, is, is changing um, again. Right. So uh, very, very interesting. Before we go to the Q&A, I want to bring up a final point. Uh, first of all, generally speaking, can you say something about the lasting impact of the hippie movement? And more specifically, we are uh, experiencing the mass demonstrations these days in Belarus against uh, President Alexander Lukashenko, who is uh, suspected to have rigged the elections. Uh, do you recognize any uh, hippie spirit in the demonstrations against Lukashenko? Very much so, actually. I mean, it's, um, I've seen it less lately in the last few days, but initially there were a lot of uh, Victor Tsoi references, who, of course, himself was <laughs> not a hippie, but probably more a sort of kind of glam rock um, style figure. But um, he is all part of that larger Sistema rock music phenomenon. And of course, he wrote that song, um, We Want Changes, um, which um, was the, uh, the anthem of the Paris Troika um, movement. Um, and then, of course, I was uh, reminded that, um, in fact, the, um, the most violent and uh, in many ways the most plucky hippie demonstration that happened in the early 70s was not in Moscow, but in Grodna, where, where hippies protested against being mixed up by the police. Um, and so Grodna is in, in, in um, uh, Belarus. And... Um, basically had a, a demonstration against police power, uh, which was, uh, I think, literally a first um, in the Soviet Union. There were demonstrations against, or strikes as in Novocherkask, against shortages. There were demonstrations uh, against the Vietnam War, as the one uh, Sonso organized in Moscow, but really a demonstration against um, police violence um, that uh, was new, and, and they were very, very brutally um, put down. But Grodner featured very long in graffitis, um, justice for Grodner, freedom for Grodner, that was uh, still graffitis which could be seen um, a lot uh, during Paris Troika. And when I look at the sort of pictures coming out of Minsk um, of, of um, people putting community um, against uh, repression, that very um, almost ritualistic creation of community around uh, certain rituals, around certain songs, around certain very easy markers. Um, that is exactly the same tactics with which the hippies survived for so many years. Great. 
Thank you so much, Juliane. And in the meantime, we already have quite a number of uh, questions in the Q&A box. I start with uh, Amanda Humphreys. She writes, what do you know about the music scene at that time? I'm developing a film about four teens who form a Rolling Stones tribute band in Estonia in 1969. Apparently due to the lack of vinyl bands used to record on an X-ray film. Yeah, that's, that's correct. The, the music scene, of course, um, came out directly from this sort of bootleg jazz music uh, scene. Music was unbelievably important. Um, it's sort of always hard to convey how important it is in a normal talk because it really was the motor that, uh, that kept the movement going. Um, and it happened on two levels. One of them was the live music events. And uh, certainly in the beginning of the 70s, most of the bands were tribute bands who would sing in English because singing in English was cool. And only later on did Russian acquire um, that sort of status as, as, as the more poetic language. Um, and um, and on, on what was called um, initially the X-rays, um, but they were very soon um, replaced by what was called the magnetophone. Um, and I know that the vendor has several copies of um, these old, very large tape reels um, as well from, from concerts um, of bands in Leningrad and, and Moscow. Um, but I can, um, I, I, I should point um, her to, to Terje Tomistu, the, the maker of the film Soviet Hippies, um, who is Estonian herself and has concentrated on Estonian hippies and knows an awful lot about the local Estonian scene, which was very vibrant because Estonia was always seen as a little bit more um, open and liberal than, than the rest of the Soviet Union. Right, thank you. The next question is by Richard Schoenberger. Was there a music movement associated with the Soviet hippie movement like psychedelic mu music in San Francisco? Well, the truth is that of course, then that is sort of one of the, the, the specificities of things having to go through the Iron Curtain. There's a certain kind of um, randomness to it. There's of course the big bands like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, they made it through just by sheer number and the way how they were played on BBC and Voice of America and Deutsche Welle. Um, and then there is a certain amount of uh, random extras which have made it through and, and fell into, into hands of people who copied it. So Adriano Celentano, I think, always figures um, unsurprisingly large, uh, probably not known to any American audience, but he was an Italian um, singer-songwriter in, in, in the time. There wasn't really this much um, psychedelic music, even though the Estonian scene, and that comes out very well in that film, Soviet Hippies as well, they, um, they sounded quite psychedelic um, at, at times, sometimes more by default because the equipment wasn't so great. Um, so the sound effects were what we would call these days avant-garde, but um, were um, probably more due to, to lack of, of synthesizers and, and amplifiers and, and the like. Um, but the music scene is an almost entirely, I don't want to say separate chapter because it's completely entwined, but it's, um, they, they again functioned according to different principles because they did make a living with, with the music. Um, and there was a huge uh, market for these kind of bands playing to Komsomol gatherings. So they straddled much more the official and unofficial sphere than the hippies themselves did. We have one uh, final question about uh, music uh, by, uh, from uh, Bruce Hollihan, who writes, uh, you've mentioned the musical influences from the West. And I'd like to know, did you find any influence from German music groups from the crowd rock era, such as Kahn, Neu, Faust and others? And there is a second question. Also, were the benign effects of things such as progressive churches and Buddhism noticed in Eastern Bloc countries and the Soviet Union? So on the German influences, I have to pass. I don't think so, but I don't want to say categorical no, because the Soviet Union is large. And as I say, there's a certain amount of um, random transmission via personal people. And I know of at least two Germans who traveled um, frequently um, and um, persistently to the Soviet Union to meet with local hippies, um, one of them from Hamburg, and he was a sort of new left person. But it was also it was interesting to, to speak to him because one could see where the gaps of understanding were. I mean, he of course came with a new new left idea of, of um, a very strict um, anti-authoritarianism, but also um, a certain venerance for for Marxism um, and and revolution, which uh, of course wasn't shared by the local Soviet hippies. Um, and um, musically. I, I haven't seen any evidence. That's later um, 
almost post-Soviet times when some German bands make it very big um, in the Russian speaking uh, sphere. But um, I don't want to exclude. Um, and the second one on, on Eastern spirituality, yes, um, mm -hmm. that was um, relatively big. I found it interesting that once I went delve deeper and tried to see, okay, what actually arrived and what was used. Um, it, it didn't arrive from the East, which would have been a, a logical way, because of course the Soviet Union stretched all the way into Asia and people traveled to Central Asia specifically to sometimes learn about Islam, um, to meet with shamans, um, especially down in the Altai. But most of the um, esotericism and Eastern religion actually arrived via people like Nicholas Röhrig um, and, um, and Western interpreters of, of Eastern spirituality. So it arrived via the Western route, um, and, uh, which I, I think is interesting um, insofar as, as that opening to the East was much more uh, limited and much more marred by cultural barriers um, than that opening to the West where a lot of translation happened. Um, right. Uh, yeah, so I mean, most hippies practiced something like uh, yoga and um, a lot of them were vegetarians. In the end, um, the victory, however, was uh, carried by the Orthodox Church. Um, the large number of hippies uh, turned to Orthodoxy, um, partly, of course, because um, practicing religion was also forbidden. So practicing the main religion was not seen as mainstream, but as, as underground. And even today, um, I would say that uh, the majority um, of, of ex-hippies gravitates towards the Orthodox Church. Right. Uh, the next uh, question is by Etna Alvarez. Was there any opportunity in doing your research to actually interview hippies? And if yes, how many and with what results? Well, uh, yes, I know you have lots to say about it. <laughs> I spent 10 years, uh, my last 10 years of my life, I interviewed uh, hippies and it has been great. Uh, I, I literally just sent the book off to the printers. So I, this, this chapter is unfortunately over, I, in the end, I had about 140 interviews, um, mostly with, with hippies. I, I had a few interviews with people who were persecuting hippies um, or with German or American visitors, but about 125 of them, I would say, were with hippies. And I could have done many more. I literally, um, I just couldn't process any more information. And um, of course, the experience of interviewing these people has been very varied um, but um, it has been I, I really have to say this has been a privilege and in this research project more than in any other I've ever done before um, I have to say it's a, it's a two-way street this project has completely shaped me um, as, as well as well I mean I cannot separate that from my own life trajectory anymore right the next question is from Deborah Marlin who incidentally actually reconstructed the Soviet hippie flag for our exhibition uh, from a hippie exhibition in Moscow, 1975. And she asked, was there a drug scene and did they cultivate pot? Ah, yes, I, I want to quickly uh, find the picture I had yeah, perfect, of the hippie perfect, yeah. flag because it, is, uh, it, it turned out so beautiful. Um, uh, we, we jumped over that um, whole episode of the hippies having a moment of glory in a 1975 exhibition of um, Here's the flag um, in, in, uh, of nonconformist art in, in, in Moscow. Um, yes, uh, there, there, was, um, there were a lot of drugs um, and most hippies consumed um, some form of drugs. Um, some favored the alcohol um, and, and, and some basically made um, their own drugs. Um, there was also, however, one has to say that um, a whole contingent, especially in later generations of hippies who objected um, to, to drugs and uh, propagated clean living and it came to tension between these different groups. Um, the drugs um, which did exist were mainly made out of poppy seeds. Um, you can see here, this is a cartoonist drawing of uh, somebody um, at a, also in 1975. Um, it's, it's called the last hooray and uh, you see a poppy flower at, at, the, at the left and, and somebody taking it down and basically you had two variations you could either take the seeds and boil them up and inject them or you could make a tea out of it what that was called kupna and um, even though opium is not known to have psychedelic effects i found very interesting the descriptions people give of their drug trips um, are very psychedelic and i always wondered if that is because they have read so much about psychedelia and LSD that they were determined to, to have this muck as the LSD substitute that it actually acquired properties for them which usually are not um, 
related uh, to, to opium. So I, I would say there was a definite um, um, correspondence. Um, this is the, the diary. I mean, you can see, I mean, obviously the drugs are dangerous business and not for all of them it ended um, happy. In fact, a lot of creative people did end up uh, rather heavy drug addicts um, while remaining incredibly creative. And this is from the archive of Asasello, who was Ophelia's boyfriend and a heavy drug addict. And um, in his notebook, you can see he has these drawings. And then sometimes when his injection would go wrong, he would sort of uh, work around um, his blood stains in order to, to, to create art around it. Um, but um, in terms of the, the significance of drugs as something that widens their, their conscience, that um, was definitely part um, of the drug taking community um, ideology. And even later on, when actually LSD was more widely available in the 90s, um, the Soviet hippies um, did not uh, actually um, change over to Western style drugs. Um, they remained um, with their homebrews. Right, right, right. I have a double question here from Erika Camisa Morale. She asks, uh, could you specify the timeline of the hippie movement? You quickly mentioned it, but could you go a little bit more in depth? And she also says, I noticed a picture taken at Yasnaya Polyana. What were the Russian or Slavic models for the hippie movement in Russia? Okay, quickly to the timeline. Um, so the earliest hippies um, in the Baltic states, um, I think 1966, 67, but really 69 is uh, when um, it takes off in earnest, especially in Moscow and the Sistema takes off. Um, then there you have what is called the first um, Sistema, which runs into trouble in 1971 with this demonstration um, and then kind of uh, goes, it, it splits gradually into two groups, one which is more alcohol orientated and uh, led by Sonse and the other one um, which gravitates to a place called the Café Aromat uh, in, in Moscow is more drug oriented but also more intellectual um, and they create what is called the second system and actually really the, the real blossoming of the hippie movement I would say is the second system when they start having all the summer camps that again is come to an end to a certain extent in 1980 with the Olympics, um, very heavy arrests, a lot of people drop out of the movement and then you de facto have a third generation. They don't call themselves anymore the third system but there's definitely a generational change over in the late 70s, early 80s, um, where you get people like Umka, who's a relatively famous singer in, in Russia, um, and um, a lot of young hippies, um, which then basically make the this, this thema more political again in, in, the, in the 80s. Um, and then already in the late 80s, it starts to disintegrate because the Soviet Union is disintegrating, so there's sort of kind of counter pole um, but even in 1993, we still have the creation of a, Moscow, of a university of hippies um, in, in Moscow. Um, and um, I would say, I mean, some people say it never ended. Um, but I would say that by the late 90s, with the, the various economic crashes, it basically subsumes to the, the realities um, of life. And of course, now there's a cyber community again. So there is a kind of resurrection of the system. Right. Yes, now Polana, that is indeed a true Tolstoy, and Tolstoyism was one of the intellectual feeders of the hippie movement. It really, it was a very broad church, and you could be a hippie with many um, beliefs. Um, some of them really only believed in the Beatles. Um, some of them were Tolstoyans, some of them were Hare Krishna. Um, and because it never had to define or for what it really stood, it only had to define against what it stood, um, it, it functioned um, as a space which could accommodate all these people. But it's interesting to see, of course, what, what, what are the directions um, people took, for example, in the post-Soviet Union. And you have everything from um, people who are now working with Navalny um, to people working in the presidential administration, from people who are ardent Russian nationalists um, to people who are ardent Ukrainian nationalists. Um, so um, the, the kind of diversity within uh, then really became obvious uh, once the lid was taken off and the, the lid meaning the sort of Soviet system that held it in place. Yeah, and that actually seems to partially answer uh, two questions by Ray Cunningham, which I'll take uh, together. Uh, such a fascinating discussion, he writes, in a very relevant topic, both culturally and sociologically. How would you characterize the views of these old hippies today in terms of their political impacts, their roles in affecting change now, etc. 
and then he says, I'm interested in this perspective relative to the American hippie generation, many of whom grew into political conservatives, but many others who continued on the, on the path of challenging the norms and even becoming leaders in politics, academia, and so on. So unfortunately, of course, the, the path for hippies to, um, for Soviet hippies to um, become very influential in Soviet society was um, much more difficult, um, partly because they were in the end damaged um, as people, especially people who were drug um, addicts or drug users um, were very often imprisoned in psychiatry. And I, I mean, there are several fates of people where I can really see people being uh, destroyed by, by the system over a longer period of time. And these were the people who would have been very creative, could have become Steve Jobs or um, Roy Lichtenstein, uh, no matter if one thinks that this is a good or bad thing, but basically um, these are people who are very active, uh, very good in organization of, uh, often, and but literally went nowhere because the Soviet system just did not allow that. Um, on the other hand, I think the memory of, of, of hippies um, is now playing a big role. And as I say, there are, seven, there are definitely several people, especially of that second system, who, who work very actively in liberal circles um, um, and uh, are active in street protests. Um, and, and none of them is, is in, in any way um, a super prominent or a politician um, themselves. Um, but it's, what is striking is, is that sort of, um, a lot of people are very radical and you, you find these radicals still in a lot of radical expressions. So you, you have very radical conservatives and you have very radical liberals. Um, and I think the sort of uh, what united them was always their radicality rather than the content um, of, of their radicality because they really had to choose it. They had to choose to be against the system. You couldn't be an accidental hippie in the Soviet Union. You really, had to, to choose that life um, and you, you paid for it um, too. So uh, you even have people who worked, for example, with people who in the, in the Don Bus, um, with this guy Strelitz, um, who was one of the sort of agitators um, of Russian nationalism in, in the Don Bus, and you, you have former hippies um, working with him in a sort of kind of paramilitary uh, situation. Um, and then you have people who, are, who very much uh, remained um, in that sort of hippie love and peace, also the hippie um, exterior, um, and um, are sort of kind of almost relics um, of, of um, their time. So it's, it's, it's hard to generalize, but I must say that the, the one thing I would really underline is um, how many of them in the end did, did become victims of, of the regime nonetheless. Right. Um, and, and, and sometimes I feel sad writing about these people and thinking what, what, could, have, what could have become of them, um, all these energy and the creativity and the interesting um, thoughts and, 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 and the, the willingness to, to stand up for them. Right. I want to conclude with a very um, interesting observation by Donna Kent who, who writes, it's ironic that it seems that the Soviet hippies were in opposition to Marxism, and yet in the United States, many hippies were trending towards socialist ideals. In fact, many of the ways large gatherings and concerts were based on meeting the people's needs. The hog farm is one example. So I think that is an interesting paradox. Yeah. Yes, it's, and it's, it's one which um, existed, um, and I think most um, Soviet hippies at the time did not see it as a paradox. I have, in my interviews, I, I usually, after a while, I, I ask them um, uh, if they were are aware of this, this idiosyncrasy, and sometimes people get very angry um, because they feel like I question their anti-communist credentials. Um, um, or sometimes they, they get very pensive and say, yeah, it is, it is interesting that in, in the end, we, we kind of never dissolved this tension that we had all these um, ideals, which actually, to a certain extent, originated in communism. And yet we, we, we were, of course, they would say we were an anti arden communist, we were anti-Soviet um, anti Union, anti-Soviet system. Um, and in, in that respect, um, even though they didn't formulate that in their ideology, of course, they are in the line of many neo-Leninist, uh, like, uh, neo-Marxist um, groups, including the whole human rights um, movement in the Soviet Union, which actually wanted to create um, a better socialism. I think if one had pinned down hippies at the time, um, and I, I have sort of tried to do this a little bit in my chapter on ideology, you can actually find a lot of elements which they, where you can see the Soviet socialization. That is not only true for a certain kind of the commitment to socialism, 
but also um, in a certain kind of patriotism. Um, the, the, the socialization in the Soviet Union as socialist, as patriotic, um, was not, uh, even if people became hippies, that it did not mean that um, they kicked out everything they had learned in childhood. Um, and a lot of them actually had gone through Komsomol careers before they um, became hippies. But of course, one has to say in the 70s, the general mood was one of not anymore of, of being believers. Um, so they were not growing up in an environment where even their, their parents uh, were particularly ardent communists. You had to go into their grandparents' generation to really um, find um, believers. And some of them actually, um, particularly because of course they sometimes came out of these families where the grandparents were generals or um, party members, I and mean, not only party members, but high ranking party members. And they had, a, they had a certain respect that they could relate better to their grandparents than to their actual parents, who of course were horrified that their children had long hair and were endangering their careers. And um, while with their grandparents, even though in terms of content, um, they were completely diagonally opposite, um, they, there was a certain uh, affinity, which I think comes down to the fact that they, that, that is due to that paradox. Right. Well, Julianne, uh, thank you so much for a really fascinating presentation. There's so much to talk about uh, with this topic. And of course, we weren't able to uh, cover everything, but I think you gave a very um, interesting, in-depth uh, uh, presentation of uh, what the movement was all about. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. I will make some advertisement here because actually if you want to have more in depth, my book is coming out <laughs> in December. It is called Flowers Through Concrete um, Exper um, Explorations in Soviet Hippie Land. Um, and um, yes, hopefully coming to a library near you soon. Great. Perfect. So next week um, uh, we have our second Art Past Present interview with uh, LA-based textile artist Anisa Shami which is co-hosted by Vera Karapetian and me. And then in two weeks, we resume uh, Cold War Spaces with an interview with Daniel Pick, psychoanalyst and professor of history at Birkbeck um, at the University of London about psychic space brainwashing in the Cold War. I hope to see you in both uh, these interviews next week and in two weeks. Um, thank you very much and bye-bye. <laughs>